Psalm chapter 22, what we are about to see in the first three verses of Psalm 22 is something that is so holy. It is so, so holy. This is something that our eyes are not worthy to look on. So holy. This is our Lord crying out to God the Father from the cross. This is a moment between God. This is a holy, holy moment. A private moment between God the Father and God the Son. This is a moment between the throne and the cross. Now, I can't imagine that there's hardly anyone who's old enough to know anything about history that does not know about the cross. I can't imagine there's anyone who does not know that this man, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. The cross is the issue of life. The cross is the message of the gospel. The preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. But preaching the cross is not just preaching that the cross happened. Preaching the cross is preaching what happened on the cross. It's not just preaching that the cross happened, which is what so many people stand up and do. They preach that the cross happened. But that's not preaching the cross. Preaching the cross is preaching what happened on the cross. What happened on the cross is the gospel. That is the gospel. There is only one gospel message. The Apostle Paul said there's not another. There is one. Anything other than exactly what happened on the cross is not the gospel. Now, our Lord asked His Father a question in this defining moment of our lives. And then He answered the question right after He asked it. He asked a question, and then He answered it. And what He tells us right here will forever be the message of the Gospel. Psalm 22, verse 1, He said, my God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Why art Thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but Thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. That was his question. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? The subject of this message and the title of this message is, Why was Christ forsaken? Why was Christ forsaken? Everybody knows that he was forsaken. Everybody knows that he was. But the saving declaration of the gospel is, why was he forsaken? Why? The preaching, the understanding, the believing of why. Why was Christ forsaken? Why did God the Father forsake Christ? He gives us the answer in verse 3. He said, it's because thou art holy. Thou art holy. Now, if we miss this, we'll miss salvation. If we miss this, we will miss the gospel and we will miss Christ. We'll end up missing Christ. On the cross, the Lord asked the great question of salvation. 
Why hast thou forsaken me? And on the cross, he gave us the saving answer. He said, it's because thou art holy. Thou art holy. Now, if we want to know the truth of the gospel, if we want to understand what is the actual message of the gospel, we're going to have to find out what the word holy means. If we want to understand the gospel... We're going to have to find out what holy means. Our Savior said, the reason this is happening is because you are holy. You're holy. What does holy mean? The definition of the word holy is perfect, just, clean, pure. Psalm 145 verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. Holy means He must do what's right. That's what it means. He must do what's right. Who is going to stand in that holy hill? He that has clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. If God is holy, it means he can only do right. He can only do right. Now, what is right? What is right? What determines whether something is right or wrong? How do we know what's right? Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, verse 12 says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The law that God gave, God's law is holy. It's holy. God is holy. God's law is holy. God is His law. God is His law. God must do the law. God can only do the law because God is the law. When God gave the law to Moses, He said, this is what I demand to stand into my presence. This is what must happen if, if a sinner is going to stand in my presence. What He was telling him was, this is what I am. How good does someone have to be to stand in the presence of God? as good as God. And he told Moses, this is what I am. How good and right is God? Read His law. Read His law. Let's open His law. He said, I didn't come to put away the law. I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill every jot and tittle. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15 verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You know what he's telling us right there? Why? 
He's telling us why. Why did Christ die? Why was Christ forsaken? Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What Scriptures is He talking about? The only Scriptures they had then. The law that God gave to Moses. The law and the prophets. He's saying this is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to His holy law. God the Father forsook Christ according to His holy law. Our Lord asked the question as He hung there suffering the punishment and the wrath of the sin of His people, He asked the question, Why hast Thou forsaken Me? And He immediately acknowledged the answer to His Father. He said, It's because you must do right. You must do right. You are holy. You must judge according to your holy law. You must. What's written in the law? What did the holy God write in His law? What did He write in His law? Look with me at Exodus 23. Exodus 23. Now in chapter 20, He gave the Ten Commandments. And in the following chapters, He continued giving commandments, laws. And Exodus 23 verse 7 says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not. He said, do not kill an innocent man. Do not do it. He said, I will not have it. I will not have it. That's wickedness in my eyes. He went on to say in verse 7, for I will not justify the wicked. That's a holy law of God. Do not kill an innocent man. Turn with me over to Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19 verse 10 says, That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. He said, if you shed innocent blood, your life is going to be required for it. If you shed innocent blood, it's sin against me. It's sin. Look at Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27 verse 25 says, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. The holy God said in His holy law, Whoever kills an innocent person is cursed. Whoever does it is cursed. And we could just keep going. We could look at Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. Let me show you one more. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Okay. 
Proverbs 6, verse 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. God said, I hate it. I will not have it. I will not have it. If that is the case, let me ask us this question. Why was Christ forsaken? Why was Christ forsaken and slain? It's because He was made to be guilty. When we hear the truth that He paid our debt, He paid our debt. It's called redemption. He paid it in full. The price paid in full. When we hear that, the flesh wrongly, hold on to the word wrongly for just a minute. The flesh wrongly gets the idea in the mind that we sinners got ourselves into a debt that we could not pay. Total, total bankruptcy. Debt, couldn't pay it. The debt of sin, the bankruptcy of sin. No money to give. And the great banker, the judge, said, that's it, time's up. Payments due. Either pay the debt or suffer the punishment. Pay it or suffer. So Christ, being the rich inheritor of all things, said, how much does He owe? And the great banker gave the price and he said, I'll pay it. And the great banker was satisfied and said to the debtor, you're free to go. The banker was happy, and the debtor was set free. Now, if that's the case, if that is what happened, why was Christ forsaken? Why was Christ made to suffer the punishment and the wrath and the destruction for bearing our sin. Paying off someone else's debt is a great honor. It is a great, great honor. That is something that is in perfect agreement with God's law. He said, give. He said, help your neighbor. He said, love your neighbor. Why would he suffer vengeance when honor is due? Why would God kill an innocent man? Why would God kill an innocent man? If God killed an innocent man, and if Christ accomplished innocence, if Christ made us to be innocent, what's to stop God from killing us? God kills innocent men. To believe that is to believe that God is not holy. It is to believe that He's unjust. But God is holy. God is is holy. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 32 says, 
the place of the Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Why didn't he open his mouth? It's because he was made to be guilty. Who stands in humiliation? Not the one who has the money in his hand ready to pay. The one who stands there in the great debt is the one who stands in humiliation. Look with me at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Why was Christ forsaken? It's because God made Him to be guilty. That's so fearful to me. That is so fearful and holy. Never did our Lord commit sin. Never. He was the spotless substitute. Perfection. Absolute perfection. The gospel in one word is substitution. Substitution. He was the perfect, spotless Substitute, but for our sake. From the crown of His head to the sole of His foot, He became what brought the curse on us. Sin. He made Himself to be the actual wounds and bruises and putrefying sores of sin. It's the only way God could forsake him. It is the only way. God is holy. He's holy. God the Father looked at His own Son. In the moment that Christ made Himself, as Hebrews 7 says, to become us. He became us. In that moment, God looked at Christ and He saw us standing there. Substitution is not a theory. It's a transaction. And He looked at Christ and He saw us standing there. God looked at His own Son made to be everything that we are. And He said, according to holiness, you must be forsaken. You must be forsaken. And God Almighty, according to holiness and according to justice, poured out His wrath and He killed the guilty man. He said, I will by no means clear the guilty. I will not do it. That's the best news I've ever heard in my life. Just a minute ago, she was playing that first song she played, and one of the lines in that song says, I cannot tell how or why He should have lifted me. I can't figure this out. I cannot figure this out. This, His holiness is the solid rock a believer stands on. The security of the gospel is in the fact that God's holy. He's holy and He will only do what's right. He will by no means clear the guilty. He will by no means clear the guilty. And He will by no means condemn the innocent. He will by no means. As soon as God judged 
and killed the guilty man, he turned and looked at his people. Now being substituted with Christ, substitution is not a theory, it's a transaction. He turned and looked at his people, seeing that Christ was made to be from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, everything they were. And at that very moment, all of his own were made to be from the crown of their head to the sole of their foot, the righteousness of God. We became as holy and as pure and as spotless as God. That's so fearful to me. God looked at us and He saw us standing there made to be everything Christ is. And He said according to holiness, according to the holy law of God Almighty, you must be set free. You have to be. God Almighty said, I cannot punish you. I can't kill you. I'm holy. It would go against my holiness. It would undo my holiness. And that can't happen. That cannot happen. Therefore, because of, as the Scripture says, the beauty of holiness. Oh, the beauty of holiness. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's in Romans 8. Turn with me over there. We'll close with this. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 33 says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You know what that means? Because of what he became, because of what our Lord made himself to be, because He endured and he, and he conquered death and sin. Because of everything He accomplished on the cross. He won the victory. Because He truly did put everything away. It is finished. Because of that, God the Father, in all of His holiness, in all of His justice, has highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name. And according to holy justice, God Almighty has decreed this is what must take place. This is what must be done. This is the only thing that's good and right. Every time you hear His name, every single time you hear His name named, Every knee must bow. And every tongue must confess that He's Lord. In agreement with all holiness, God the Father has now decreed, my people are justified and my Son is Lord. That's why Christ was forsaken. That's why He was forsaken. That His people might be justified and that He might be Lord. And He is, isn't He? And we love it, don't we? And we're going to be crying that for all eternity, aren't we? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's good news to me. Thank you, Brother Clay. <clears throat>